Welcome to Vail. I am Dorothy, and we are so glad you are here with us today to worship at our virtual service. We invite you to put any prayer concerns in the chat so we can lift them up to the community. Also, if you want more information about this service or Vail UMC in general, go to bit.ly forward slash Vail Church Info. Please join us in our opening hymn, What Child Is This? Guidance and reminders appear in many forms. In the start of this new year, let us seek and rejoice in the light of the world. Let us keep our eyes and ears open to the teachings of Christ. Please join me in the call to worship. God of glory, your splendor shines from a manger in Bethlehem, where the light of the world is humbly born into the darkness of human night. Open our eyes to Christ's presence in the shadows of our world, so that we, like him, may become beacons of your justice and defenders of all for whom there is no room. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Praise is our cry, O Holy One of Israel. For you have come among us and borne our burdens. Give us open hearts that we might embrace our suffering sisters and brothers and welcome Jesus in the hospitality we show to exiles. Amen. Let us take a moment of silent reflection. Hear the good news. The one who came is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, and the light of the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. The Messiah came to redeem the world but it wasn't an easy road. Traveling and exile came next. Joseph continued to receive guidance from an angel. He and Mary were asked over and over to put their trust in God. Let us hear what happened after the wondrous birth of Christ in Matthew 2, verses 3, 13 through 33. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up! 
Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks be to God. This is the story of the elves and the shoemaker. There was once a shoemaker who, through no fault of his own, had become so poor that at last he had only leather enough left for one pair of shoes. At evening, he cut out the shoes which he intended to begin upon the next morning, and since he had good conscience, he lay down quietly, said his prayers, and fell asleep. In the morning when he had said his prayers and was preparing to sit down to work, he found the pair of shoes standing finished on his table. He was amazed and could not understand it in the least. He took the shoes in his hand to examine them more closely. They were so neatly sewn that not a stitch was out of place and were as good as the work of a master hand. Soon after, a purchaser came in, and as he was much pleased with the shoes, he paid more than the ordinary price for them, so that the shoemaker was able to buy leather for two more pairs of shoes with the money. He cut them out in the evening, and next day, with fresh courage, was about to go to work. But he had no need to, for when he got up, the shoes were finished and buyers were not lacking. These gave him so much money that he was able to buy leather for four pairs of shoes. Early next morning, he found the four pairs finished, and so it went on. What he cut out at evening was finished in the morning, so that he was soon again in comfortable circumstances and became a well-to-do man. Now it happened one evening, not long before Christmas, when he had cut out some shoes as usual, that he said to his wife, 
how would it be if we were to sit up tonight and see who it is that lends us such a helping hand? The wife agreed, lit a candle, and they hid themselves in the corner of the room behind the clothes that were hanging there. At midnight came two little naked men who sat down at the shoemaker's table, took out the cut up work, and began with their tiny fingers to stitch, sew, and hammer so neatly and quickly that the shoemaker could not believe his eyes. They did not stop till everything was quite finished and stood complete on the table. Then they ran swiftly away. The next day the wife said, the little men have made us rich and we ought to show our gratitude. They were running about with nothing on and must freeze with cold. Now I will make them little shirts, coats, waistcoats, and hose, and will even knit them a pair of stockings, and you shall make them each a pair of shoes. The husband agreed, and at evening, when they had everything ready, they laid out the presents on the table and hid themselves to see how the little men would behave. At midnight, they came skipping in and were about to set to work, but instead of the leather ready cut out, they found the charming little clothes. At first they were surprised, then excessively delighted. With the greatest speed, they put on and smoothed down the pretty clothes, singing, Now we're boys so fine and neat, why cobble more for others' feet? Then they hopped and danced about, and leapt over chairs and tables and out the door. Henceforward they came back no more, but the shoemaker fared well as long as he lived, and had good luck in all his undertakings. The end.
The Boy with the Box by Mary Griggs Van Voorhees. It was an ideal Christmas day. The sun shone brightly, but the air was crisp and cold, and snow and ice lay sparkling everywhere. A light wind the night before had swept the blue ice-bound river clean of snow, and by afternoon the broad bend near Creightonsville was fairly alive with skaters. Tom Reynolds moved in and out among the happy throng with swift, easy strokes, his cap on the back of his curly head and his brown eyes shining with excitement. Now and again, he glanced down with pride at the new skates that twinkled beneath his feet. Jolly ramblers, sure enough. Ever since Ralph Evans had remarked with a tantalizing toss of his handsome head that no fellow would try to skate on anything but Jolly Ramblers, Tom had yearned with an inexpressible longing for a pair of those wonderful skates. And now they were his, and the ice was fine, and the Christmas sun was shining. Tom was rounding the big bend for at least the 50th time when he saw skimming gracefully toward him through the merry crowd a tall boy in a fur-trimmed coat. That's Ralph Evans now, Tom said to himself. Just wait till you see these skates, old boy, and maybe you won't feel so smart. And with slow, cautious strokes, he made his way through laughing boys and girls to a place just in front of the tall skater, coming toward him down the river. When Ralph was almost upon him, Tom paused and in conspicuous silence looked down at his shining skates. Hello, said Ralph good-naturedly, seizing Tom's arm and swinging him around. Then, taking in the situation with a careless glance, he added, Got a new pair of skates for Christmas? Jolly Ramblers, said Tom impressively, the best Jolly Ramblers in the market. Ralph was a full head taller, but Tom delivered himself of this speech with his head held high, and he felt every inch as tall as the boy in front of him. If Ralph was impressed, he failed to show it, as he said carelessly, hmm. Pretty good little skates those are, the Jolly Ramblers. You said no game fellow would use any other make, said Tom hotly. Oh, but that was nearly a year ago, said Ralph. I got a new pair of skates for Christmas, too, he added. Clubhouse skates. Something new in the market just this season. Just look at the curve of these skates, will you? And that clamp that you can't shake off even if you had to? They're guaranteed for a year, and if anything gives out, you get a new pair for nothing. I gave my Jolly Ramblers to a kid about your size. A mighty good little skate they are. And with a long, graceful stroke, Ralph Evans skated away. It seemed to Tom Reynolds that all of his Christmas joy went skimming away behind him. The sun still shone, the ice still gleamed, and skaters still laughed and sang, but Tom moved slowly on with listless, heavy strokes. The Jolly Ramblers still twinkled beneath his feet, but he didn't look down at them anymore. What were the use of Jolly Ramblers when Ralph Evans had a pair of clubhouse skates that cost more, had a graceful curve, and a faultless clamp, and were guaranteed for a year? It was only four o'clock when Tom slipped his new skates over his shoulder and started up the bank for home. He was slouching down the main street, head down, hands deep in his pockets, when turning a corner, he ran plump into a full moon. Now I know it sounds a little unusual for full moons to be walking about the streets by daylight, but that is the only adequate description of the round freckled face that beamed at Tom from behind a great big box held by two sturdy arms. That came pretty close to being a collision, said the owner of the full moon, still beaming as he set down the box and leaned against a building to rest for a moment. Nobody hurt, I guess, said Tom. Been down to the ice? asked the boy eagerly. I could see the skaters from the store. Oh, I see. You got some new skates for Christmas. Aren't they beauties? And he beamed at the despised Jolly Ramblers with his heart in his blue eyes. A pretty good little pair of skates, said Tom in Ralph's condescending tone. Good. Well, I should guess yes. In spite of his ill humor, Tom couldn't help but respond to the warm interest of the shabby boy at his side. He knew him to be Harvey McGinnis, the son of a poor widow who worked at Patton's department store after school. Looking at the great box with an awakening interest, he remarked kindly, what have you been doing with yourself on Christmas day? Want to know sure enough, asked Harvey. 
mysteriously, his round face beaming more brightly than ever. Well, I've been doing the Santa Claus act down at Patton's store. About a week ago, he went on, leaning back against the tall building and thrusting his hand in his own well-worn pockets. About a week ago, I was cleaning out the storeroom. I came upon three big boxes with broken dolls. Beauties they were, I can tell you. The Lady Jane in a blue silk dress, Lady Clarabelle in pink, and Lady Matilda in shimmering white. Nothing wrong with them either. Only broken rubber bands that holds their joints in place and keeps their heads from rolling around. They could be fixed in no time, I said to myself. And what a prize they'd be for the kids, for sure. Mom and me had racked our brains considerably about how we'd scrape together money for Christmas things for the girls. So I went to the boss and I asked him right out what he'd charge me for these three ladies just as they were. And he said, Jimmy, he said, I've told him my name a dozen times, but he always calls me Jimmy. Jimmy, he said, if you come down on Christmas Day and help me take down the fixings and fix up the store for the regular trade, I'll give you the dolls for nothing. So I explained to the kids that Santa would be late in our house this year, with so many to see to, after all, it wouldn't be strange, and went down to the store early this morning and finished my work and fixed up the ladies as good as new. Would you like to see them, he added, turning to the great box with a look of pride. Sure, I'd like to see them, said Tom. With careful, almost a reverent touch, Harvey untied the string and opened the large box, disclosing three smaller boxes, one above the other. Opening the first one, he revealed a handsome doll with a blue silk dress, large dark eyes that opened and closed, and dark curling hair. This is Lady Jane, he said, smoothing her frock with a gentle finger. We're going to give her to Kitty. Kitty's hair is pretty and curly, but she hates it because it's red, and she thinks black hair is the prettiest in the world. And isn't it funny how all of us are wanting what we don't have ourselves? Tom didn't reply to this bit of philosophy, but he laid a repentant hand on the Jolly Ramblers as if he knew he'd wronged them in his heart. That's as handsome a doll as I've ever seen, he said. Pleased with his praise, Harvey opened the second box and disclosed Lady Matilda with fair golden curls and a dress of shimmering white. The Lady Matilda goes to Josephine, said Harvey. Josephine has black hair straight as string, and won't she laugh to see them, those fetching yellow curls? She will be glad, said Tom. The Lady Clarabelle was another fair-haired lady in a gown of the brightest pink. This here beauty's for the baby, said Harvey his eyes glowing. She doesn't care if the hair is black or yellow, but won't that be a stunning, stunning dress to make her eyes pop? They'll surely believe in Santa when they see these beauties, said Tom. That's just what I was saying to Mom this morning, said Harvey. Kitty's had some doubts. She's almost nine, but when she sees these ladies, she'll be sure Mom and I didn't buy them. If I had a Santa Claus suit, I'd dress up and hand them out myself. Tom's face brightened with an idea. My brother Bob's got a Santa Claus suit that he used in a show last Christmas, he said. Let me dress up and play Santa for you. The girls will never guess who I am. Wouldn't they stare, though, said Harvey delightedly. But do you think you'd want to take the time? You with a new pair of skates and the eyes so good? Of course I want to if you'll let me, said Tom. I'll skate down the river and meet you anywhere you say. Out in our backyard then at seven o'clock, said Harvey. All right, I'll be there. And with a head up and skates clinking, Tom hurried away. It was a flushed, excited boy who burst into the Reynolds quiet sitting room a few minutes later with his skates still hanging on his shoulder and his cap in his hand. Say, mother, he cried, can I have Bob's Santa Claus suit this evening, please? I'm going to play Santa Claus for Harvey McGinnis. Play Santa Claus for Harvey? Whatever do you mean? said his mother. You know Mrs. McGinnis, that poor woman who lives in the little house by the river. Her husband was killed on the railroad last winter, you know. Well, Harvey, her boy, has fixed up some grand dolls for his sisters, and he wants me to come and play Santa Claus tonight. Tom launched into a long story about Harvey and his good fortune. He must be a splendid boy, said Mrs. Reynolds and I'm sure I'll be glad to have you go. And another thing, mother, said Tom, hesitating. 
Do you think Grandma would care if I spent part of the $5 she gave me for a pair of skates for Harvey? He hasn't any skates at all, and I know he'd love to have some. It is generous of you to think of that, said his mother, and you would still have some money left for a trip down to Grandma's. But I'd like to get him some clubhouse skates, said Tom. They're a new kind that costs a little bit more. But I thought you said the Jolly Gramblers were the guest best skates, Mrs. Reynolds said, looking somewhat hurt as she glanced toward Tom to the skates on his shoulder and back to his face. They are, Mother. They're just dandy, said Tom, blushing with shame that he'd ever despised his mother's gift. But these clubhouse skates are just the kind for Harvey. You see, Harvey's shoes are old and worn, and these clubhouse skates have clamps that you can't shake loose. Then if anything happened to them before the year is up, you get a new pair for free. Harvey, you know, wouldn't have any money to be fixing skates. Well, do as you like, said Mrs. Reynolds, pleased with Tom's eagerness for such a spell of generosity with something new in her younger son. But remember, you'll have to wait a while to visit your grandma. All right, and thank you, Mother, said Tom. I can buy the skates down at Harrison's, and I'm going to go over and ask if he won't open the store up and get me a pair for a special time like this. I'm sure he will. And away he flew. That evening at seven, as the moon was rising over the hills, a short, portly Santa Claus stepped out of the dry reeds by the riverbank and walked with wonderfully nimble feet right into the McInnes's little backyard. As he neared the porch, a dark figure rose to greet him, one hand warning, held up in warning, the other holding at an arm's length, a bulky grain sack full to the brim. Here's your pack, Santa, he whispered gleefully. They're all waiting in the front room. I'll slip in the back way while you go around the front and give a good thump at the front door. Mom will let you in. Trembling with eagerness, Tom tiptoed around the house and managed to slip an oblong package into the capacious depths of the big sack as he did so. Thump, thump. How his knock echoed in the frosty air. The door swung wide and Mrs. McGinnis stood before him. Good evening, Santa. Come right in, she said. The room was small and bare, but wonderfully gay with pine and bits of red and green crepe paper saved from the fixings at the store. And on a large bed in the corner sat three little girls, Kitty with her bright curls bobbing, Josephine with her black braids, and the baby with blue eyes that twinkled and shone just like Harvey's. The fine speech that Tom had been saying to himself for the past two hours seemed to vanish into thin air before this excited little audience. But in a faltering, stammering tone, which everyone was too excited to notice, he managed to say something about Merry Christmas and good children, and then proceeded to open the magic sack. Miss Kitty McGinnis, he called out in a deep, gruff tone. Kitty took the box he'd offered with shy embarrassment, drew back the lid, and gave a cry of amazement. A doll, oh, the loveliest doll that ever was, she cried. Then turning to her brother, she whispered as softly as she could, Oh, Harvey, I'm afraid you pay too much. Oh, go on, said Harvey, his face more like a full moon than ever. Don't you know that Santa can do whatever he wants? The other dolls were with, received with raptures, Josephine stroking the golden curls of Lady Matilda with wondering fingers, and the baby dancing around and around, waving the pink robed Lady Clarabelle above her head. Mr. Harvey McGinnis, came the gruff tones of Santa Claus, and Harvey smiled over to his mother as he drew out a pair of stout cloth gloves. Mrs. McGinnis, and that good lady smiled as she shook out a dainty white apron, apron with an embroidery ruffle. I reckon Santa wanted you to wear that of a Sunday afternoon, said Harvey awkwardly, and I'll be proud to do it, said his mother. Little sacks of candy were next produced. Everyone settled down to enjoy it, thinking the bottom of the big sack must have been reached. When Santa called out in tones that trembled beneath the gruffness, another package for Mr. Harvey McGinnis. For me? What? Why? said Harvey, taking the heavy oblong bundle. Then, as the sparkling clubhouse skates met his view, his face lit up with a glory that Tom would never forget. That glory lasted but a moment, but then he turned his troubled face toward the bulky old saint. You never should have done that. These must have cost a lot. Oh, go on, was a distinctly boyish tone. Don't you know that Santa can do whatever he wants? And with a bow, old Santa was gone. 
A few minutes later, a slender boy with a bundle under his arm was skating swiftly down the shining river in the moonlight. As he rounded the bend, a tall figure in a fur-trimmed coat came skimming slowly toward him, and a voice called out in Ralph Evans' condescending tones, Well, how are those jolly ramblers doing tonight? But the answer this time was clear and glad and triumphant. The best in the world, said Tom, and isn't this the glorious night for skating? The end. As we continue to celebrate Jesus' birth, let us pray that we hear God's word clearly and receive the faith God gives. Remember to place any joys or concerns in the chat so that we can lift them up uh, as a body of Christ. The prayer response this morning is, O oh God who is with us, hear our prayer. Nurturing God, remembering the exile of the Holy Family and Herod's slaughter of the children, we remember all who need our sustaining love. Hear our prayer for the church and the community in the world. Together, let us pray for the people of this congregation. O oh God who is with us, hear our prayer. For those who suffer and those in trouble. O oh God who is with us, hear our prayer for the concerns of this local community. O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. For the world, its peoples, and its leaders. O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. For the earth you have given to our care. O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. For the church universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. In communion with the saints, O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. Grant that all people may hear together the song of joy and find their homes in the garden of justice and hope, that we may experience the fullness of life, which is your will for all, in the coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a few quick announcements. We're back to our usual 8.30 virtual and 10 a.m. in person starting January 8th. And the topic of focus will be remembering our baptism. Today's benediction. Light of life, you came in flesh, born into human pain and joy, and gave us power to be your children. Grant us faith, O Christ, to see your presence among us, so that all of creation may sing new songs of gladness and walk in the way of peace. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Bless you.